Welcome to Bible Insights with Wayne Conrad. God's Word is the lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Today's topic, Psalm 8 and the man, Christ Jesus. Listen to the words of Psalm 8. This is from the World English Bible Translation. Yahweh, our Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of babes and infants you have established strength because of your adversaries that you might silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you think of him? What is a son of man that you care for him? For you made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all sheep and cattle, yes, and the animals of the field, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes through the paths of the seas. Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This psalm is one that speaks of the great contrast between the glory and the majesty of the Creator God and mankind that he made in his own image. Mankind, not only in the glory of the original creation, but mankind in his present situation. And so the psalm can sometimes provoke both wonderment and questioning in our minds. For consider this, the psalm looks back to the original creation the way that man was made by God in his own image and given dominion over the works of his hands. Man was put here in Adam as, as you would say, the, the vice regent, uh, or the ruler in God's stead or on behalf of God of the world that God had made for him, the great paradise garden, the habitation of man at the beginning. For we read in the Genesis account, uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 2, how God made man and then he set him over the works of his hand and gave him dominion. Listen to these words that God has recorded for us through the pen of Moses. The Lord God took the man, Adam, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for the day you eat of it you shall surely die. And then God goes on and says, You know, that it's not good that man be, be alone, and so he creates Eve, a companion for him. But before all of that, God has given man in Adam rulership over all of the earth in his stead. For we read about that in Genesis chapter 1, when God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So Psalm 8 is looking back. It looks back at man in his original created state, and God has given him dominion. And so, God made him, the Psalm 8 says, a little more than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. But then when we look at the world, we see that the world is not in that exact state. And man, though he has a kind of dominion, his dominion is challenged on every front by the wild beasts, by the diseases and viruses, by all kinds of conflict within nature. Man is in a position of primacy and authority, but it is not undisputed authority, and it is certainly not 
full dominion as man was created to be. And you know the reason. Because man fell. Because Adam sinned. Because he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because he listened to the voice of his wife, who had listened to the voice of the serpent, and they ate in defiance of God. And so they were placed underneath the curse of God. And so man, after the fall, lives in a fallen world with a fallen creation around him. We're living out the result of the curse that God pronounced in Genesis chapter 3. Now, that has some wonderful words in it because found in Genesis 3 is the promise in the curse that he made to the serpent of the promise of a redeemer through the seed of the woman. But listen to what he said to the woman and to the man as a result of their sin. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So man lives outside of the garden. He lives in a created order that has been fallen and been marred and scarred by the sin of man and how it's affected nature itself. Now we know that God sent a great flood many years after the creation of Adam in the time of Noah. And he sort of wiped the world clean again. And as it were, Noah comes out of the ark almost like a second Adam. He comes out with his children and their wives, and he is told by God in Genesis chapter 9, once again, to do the same thing, to multiply and to replenish the earth. But listen to what God says in Genesis chapter 9. After Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings to the altar, the Lord God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. For the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and on all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life in it, that is blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning from every beast. I will require it and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you be fruitful and multiply, team on the earth, and multiply on it. And so this is the covenant that God established with mankind and Noah and nature after the flood. Well, this is the state of man today. Psalm 8 is looking back to the original creation, the original creation that has been marred and has been altered by the sin of man. But even in this situation, nature is still a marvel. And mankind is still a marvel. And though we are the marred image of God, though we are fallen, yet we bear a scarred image of God. It is deeply wounded. In fact, our spiritual nature is dead. But we are still a wonder in many respects. Now, God, the majestic God, has care for mankind even in this humble position. And this causes the psalmist to marvel. But here's something else we need to remember. Psalm 8 is treated in the New Testament as a messianic psalm. And so to understand it, we need to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, and verses 5 through 9. Listen as the author of Hebrews writes to us. For he has not subjected the angels, the world to come, that we are talking about. The he means God. But someone 
somewhere has testified, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. He's quoting from Psalm 8. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, this is the way God created man. And man is to have dominion over everything and everything is to be subjected to him. But we do not see this as a reality right now. There's a lot of subjection, yes, but it's not total. It is not dominion over everything, and man must struggle to maintain his place in this universe. But he goes on to say, we do not yet see everything subject to him, but we do see Jesus. And so the psalmist is saying, or the author of Hebrews is saying, the psalmist is testifying to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Now, you see, those are, those are titles that can go all the way back to creation. When God first made man in Adam, it says of him that he was the Son of God. That is, he was God's direct creation, though he was not God, but he bore a likeness to God. And he is called, obviously, a son of man because he is human, the humanity made in the image of God. But that has been lost through the fall of Adam. But it is restored in the one Christ who was promised by God even in the garden when he cursed the serpent. He promised that the seed of the woman would come and he would be the deliverer for a mankind that he would reverse the effects of the fall. So Psalm 8 is also looking forward. It looks forward to the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it looks even further to the great consummation of the last day when he who is our ascended Lord shall return again in all of his glory and the new heavens and the new earth will be established. Let's read Hebrews chapter 2. He goes on to say, we do not just see everything subjected to man, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone. He's crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that it is for this reason that the word that is, the Son took to himself human flesh, that he became a human being in order that through his incarnation as the God-man that he could redeem man. We see Jesus, the author of Hebrews says, we see Jesus in his incarnation, made a little lower than the angels as fallen man was in his state of incarnation, subject to mortality and subject to temptation. But Having come in that state, he effected the redemption of man by the offering up of his body on the tree as a sacrifice for the sins of his people. And God then raised him from the dead because he had no sin of his own and because he had paid for the sin of those whom he represented. Now Christ is not in his glorified incarnate body. His ascends into heaven after 40 days, and he is crowned with glory and honor. He is the Son of Man who is the Lord of all. We see Jesus in his incarnation, suffering our curse in his death, and risen in glory after three days, raised in his incarnate body, now glorified immortal, in which he ascended into heaven after that 40 days. Jesus in his whole dual nature is fully God and fully man crowned with glory and honor. Now man was made in the image of God and the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect image of God in the surpassing glory of his original state. He is more glorified 
even than Adam was because of his dual nature. But never forget, it's the man, Christ Jesus, that's ascended into heaven. It's the man, Christ Jesus, who is our mediator. So Hebrews and Romans speaks about Christ as the second Adam. He is the one who stands as a representative man for all of those who are joined to him by faith so that what he does affects all of those for whom he affected it, even as what Adam did affected all of mankind for whom he stood as the representative head. Redeemed humans, you see, will be resurrected in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ at the second coming. And redeemed humans under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ in the new heaven and the new earth will exercise their God-ordained role on the new earth in the eternal state. Now, Jesus in his resurrection and his ascension is the first fruits of all of that, and his great harvest will follow of all those who are joined to him by faith. And so Hebrews 2 picks up Psalm 8 as being a messianic prophecy of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ who brings to pass the fulfillment of man's original creation as being in the image of God. And he does so by bearing the curse in his own incarnate body on the tree for the death that man earned through his disobedience. But he conquered death by his resurrection and ascension. And because he has done that, he did it on the behalf of all those whom the Father has given to him. He has ascended into glory. And we are united to him by faith. And so we even now begin to experience the benefits of this great and glorious Messiah in whom the destiny of mankind is is truly wrapped up. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights. And remember, Psalm 8, it's about man. It's about the man, Christ Jesus.